Hello, and welcome to Healthcare Matters, where the medical and legal communities come to discuss healthcare matters. My name is Mike Matry, and I'm your host. Today's guest is Samuel Lieb. Mr. Lieb is the Deputy Regional Managing Partner for the Milwaukee Office of Wilson Elser, maintaining a distinguished general litigation practice representing clients in matters involving medical malpractice, oral surgical, and dental malpractice, as well as long-term care facilities and related business tra transactions and disputes nationwide. Welcome, Mr. Lieb. Hey, thanks for having me. Mr. Lieb came here today to discuss an obstetric malpractice case he recently worked on, and I'll let him introduce the case to you. Yes, thanks very much. And this is a case involving a uh, shoulder dystocia which is where the shoulder gets impinged as the, as the uh, baby comes down the birth canal, and it, dealing with a claim that this particular delivery led to a permanent brachial plexus injury. The brachial plexus are a series of nerves that lead the spine from about C, C5 to T1, and the claim is that uh, in the fashion in which uh, the birth is done puts uh, excessive or too much stretch on the brachial plexus nerves, causing injury to them and, and permanent injury. Most of the, the brachial plexus injury cases are, are, are claim a permanent injury. What makes this case unique? Well, it was unique because it, it had issues of uh, claims of both negligence, which would be uh, roughly defined as a breach of the standard of care in the actual performance of the delivery. And uh, additionally, it had claims of a failure to obtain informed consent in performing the vaginal delivery. And so it was uh, a, a very interesting case, and uh, both issues were tried, and it took two trials, actually, to, to resolve both issues. Was that because there wasn't a unanimous verdict, or does that operate differently? No, what happened is, in the first trial, there was a finding of no negligence relating to the physician, but there was a finding that informed consent uh, had not been properly obtained. And then on motions after verdict, the judge determined that the way the question was phrased on the verdict that was submitted to the jury, the question was improper, the way it was phrased. And uh, the, the essence of that issue was that when you do a medical procedure, obstetric or otherwise, when you do a medical procedure, you need to obtain informed consent for the procedure that you do. Now that may include information as to the alternative modes of therapies or treatments, uh, what else is available and the likelihood of success of other things. But in doing the thing that you did, the procedure that you did, did you obtain informed consent for that? And it's, it's not, uh, the question properly submitted to the jury does not include a question whether or not there was informed consent obtained for other procedures that you didn't do, such as C-section, such as operative delivery forceps or vacuum, uh, or any other style. It's the informed consent needs to be obtained for the procedure that you do. So the court uh, ended up uh, agreeing that the question was improperly phrased as it was submitted to the jury, and the court ordered a new trial on the informed consent, and the new trial took place, and the question was properly phrased uh, regarding the second trial, and the defense prevailed on that. Well, why don't why don't you talk to me more about how these were separated? Did the first verdict stand in any in any sense, or was it a completely new trial for the second time around for both claims? No, actually, the first trial stayed in all regards, excepting the questions relating to informed consent. So the first trial, when the jury found that there was no negligence, that uh, was maintained. There, there was no negligence, and that was never challenged by uh, the plaintiffs or anybody else. Uh, so when the second trial came about, 
it was exclusively related to informed consent and whether or not the, the uh, doctor had uh, advised the patient of uh, the type of information that a reasonable patient would want to know. There's two uh, distinct types of informed consent laws in the United States. One is where you look at the informed consent from a patient's perspective. And the question simply is, did the physician give the patient the information that a reasonable patient would want to know? That's the reasonable patient standard. And then there are many jurisdictions, and actually Wisconsin is one of them. Uh, the law changed within the last couple of years. There is what's referred to as the reasonable physician standard. You don't look at informed consent from the uh, perspective of the patient you look at it from the perspective of the doctor. And the question then becomes whether or not the doctor exercised the appropriate standard of care in informing the patient of the uh, alternative modes of therapies and treatments and the risks and benefits. So uh, two very distinct vantage points and the, the reasonable patient standard does not require expert testimony. In fact, most jurisdictions do not allow expert testimony on it because it's uh, clearly within the, the uh, scope of a jury's uh, abilities without expert submission. The second standard does require expert testimony and uh, the plaintiffs are required to have an expert to tell the jury what is the standard of care of a reasonable physician regarding giving information for informed consent. So it was um, it's very interesting trial, very unique uh, to the extent that uh, this was the sole issue that was tried in the second trial. And uh, it, in the, within the context of Wisconsin law, it's interesting because in Wisconsin, the standard just changed within the last couple of years from reasonable patient standard to the reasonable physician standard. Do you know what the majority of states use to uh, define, is it the physician standard or the patient standard? Uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't know what the majority is. I, I haven't surveyed the states, but I can tell you a lot of them use physician standards, uh, the physician standard, and I know others use the, uh, the reasonable patient standard. It, let's say you were uh, conducting a risk management seminar for physician clients of yours. What would you recommend as best practices for obtaining informed consent in uh, regard to potential claims of medical liability? Great question. This is a potential claim in all malpractice cases uh, and other healthcare provider cases. So what would be best practices? One is, uh, you know, clearly to do the right thing and to, for, for the physician or other who's involved, to give the information that, you know, reasonable physicians give if you're using the physician standard or what they think a reasonable patient would want to know. Uh, the resources available to inform the patient currently are like no other time in history. Everything from, uh, you know, just general inter internet, Googling websites, um, you can go online and actually uh, obtain illustrations or animations of particular pe uh, procedures. Uh, it's a fine line between overwhelming the patient with information that may frighten them or uh, confuse them, but uh, the resources are uh, tremendous at this point. So uh, giving them the necessary information by whatever source is necessary, whether it's showing them a video or uh, just talking with them and, and giving them websites. And then a lot of uh, venues, uh, healthcare professionals uh, provide pamphlets and a lot of specialty groups uh, have pamphlets available. And this is another uh, opportunity. A lot of times when people are in a doctor's office, uh, they're, they're not able to listen as well as maybe they would like. Uh, so to give them something that they can hold in their hand or something that they could go on the internet and locate uh, when they get home, these are tremendously helpful tools and especially for physician. But the secondary need is to document and to make sure that the records reflect uh, all that was uh, given. Uh, it, you could have a checkbox, uh, pamphlet given, uh, or conceivably you could have some checkbox that they 
uh, actually visited a website, actually saw an illustration. I know a lot of physicians, especially in the orthopedic realm, uh, use models and they will go over a model and just to have a written record saying uh, model of the pelvis reviewed or this particular illustration reviewed. Um, and clearly uh, all informed consent dialogues uh, should include uh, questions uh, that are asked by the patient and uh, answers that are given. So I would say first of all clearly to do the act and secondarily to make sure that it's uh, well documented as to what you did. You discussed how modern technology can really help with uh, convey with with acquiring informed consent from a patient. How has modern technology changed the doctor's responsibility as far as uh, uh, keeping a medical record with that informed consent? Do you have best practices that you you would recommend for uh, obtaining informed consent and making sure it's illustrated within the electronic health record? Clearly, the electronic health record, because it has things like pull-down menus and uh, and conceivably other sources that you can access right when you're in the office with the patient, uh, such as going to a particular site, either uh, intranet within the institution or outside of the institution, and identifying, here's what we're going to be doing. You'll note that... Uh, for example, in this case, uh, you know, you're, uh, we have an estimated fetal weight of the of the fetus at eight to nine pounds. That's that's a large baby, and uh, my anticipation is that there shouldn't be a problem. But uh, shoulder dystocia is a condition that can happen in any type of birth. Let me show you, you know, what what that entails. And again, I think you have to balance uh, the patient that you're interacting with, and the concern and the reasonable concern between giving too much information over uh, flooding them with information or creating concern that uh, in in perspective uh, is would overwhelm them so uh, with the resources that are available with the electronic uh, medical records the ability to check a box or even pull down a menu or note within the electronic me uh, medical record that a model was shown or illustration or diagram was uh, was shown that can go a long way especially from a risk management point of view of documenting the record and knowing that 10 years later and sometimes with obstetrical cases we these we see these cases come uh, very much downstream uh, and uh, you know when you see this at, at the passage of time uh, as those years click off, the, the documentation becomes even more important. And to retain it, and to retain it within the system of the institution is obviously important. The old adage that if it isn't in the medical record, it didn't happen. Uh, we hear that a lot. And uh, it's really uh, a, uh, a cliche that uh, in, in many regards is just not truthful. That would be like saying, if it is in the medical records, then it didn't. Ha then it did happen, and uh, it, it, it can go either way. The most important thing is to give the patient the care that they need, and uh, having done that, the, the next important thing on the agenda is make sure things are well documented. Well, Mr. Lieb, I, I want to thank you for coming on Healthcare Matters. It's been an informative experience, and, and I hope you come back soon. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for having me. Absolutely.